Welcome. Welcome again. It's great to have such a, uh, a gr big crowd here, and I think that speaks to the uh, quality of the uh, historian that we brought in to speak to you about uh, his latest book. Uh, my name is Peter Monsoor. I am the General Raymond E. Mason, Jr. Chair of Military History here at Ohio State and a faculty affiliate here at Mershon. Uh, it's my great pleasure and distinct honor to introduce Max Boot as part of the Mershon Center Speakers Series. Uh, Max is a historian, a best-selling author, and a foreign policy analyst, and I might add a very good friend of mine. And he has been called one of the world's leading authorities on armed conflict by the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He's currently the Jean J. Kil Kil Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow in National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, where we first met back in 2005, 2006, when I was a senior military fellow at the Council in New York. And we had some great times together. Um, he's also a national security columnist for the Washington Post, and many of you, I'm sure, see him uh, on almost a daily basis on uh, TV or read his columns. But his latest book is not about politics. It's about history. And the subject of his talk today is The Road Not Taken, Edward Lansdale and the American Tragedy in Vietnam, uh, which has become an instant New York Times bestseller when it came out last uh, two months ago now, January. And for those uh, who haven't noticed, there are books outside for sale, um, and they do take credit cards. Um, <laughs> Max has uh, also served as an advisor to U.S. commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I remember when I was General Petraeus' executive officer, we would bring Max in to um, look at what was going on in Iraq and give us some ideas on the way forward. Uh, so he knows of what he speaks today in terms of counterinsurgency. Um, he is also a political animal to a, a certain extent. He was a senior foreign policy advisor to John McCain's presidential campaign in 2007-2008 and a defense advisor to Mitt Romney's campaign in 2011-2012 and the head of the counterterrorism working group for Marco Rubio's campaign in 2015-2016. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in history with high honors from UC Berkeley and a master's degree in history from Yale. But I personally believe that his work goes well beyond any sort of academic qualifications. It is on a par with the best historians in my uh, uh, academic home, the Society for Military History. Please join me in welcoming Max to the Mershon Center. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pete, for that. Uh, is this thing on? Can you hear me? Yes, thumbs up. Uh, thank you very much, Pete, for that very kind introduction. Uh, there may be finer uh, soldier scholars in the land, uh, but I don't know who they are. Uh, Pete has really been had an amazing uh, career in the Army and made a huge contribution as a, uh, among other things, as a brigade commander in Iraq and then as General Petraeus as XO, and then is making a huge contribution, I think, in the academy as well, educating the next generation and furthering the study of military history which is so incredibly important for military art. So it's, it's truly, a, and, and as he said, he's a friend and been a friend since 2005 when we were sitting there at the Council on Foreign Relations and scratching our heads and trying to figure out what the hell is going on in Iraq and uh, what the way forward was. So uh, it's truly a pleasure uh, to, to be back here and, and doubly so to be introduced by, by Pete, and uh, who among other things has also written a very kind uh, review of, of my book and a magazine, the Journal of American Greatness, where that's probably the, the only kind thing they're ever going to say about me. So uh, I'm delighted to take it. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, uh, my book on, uh, on Edward Lansdale, who was one of the most unusual general officers in the history of the United States Air Force or really any other military service. He is somebody who at one point was quite famous. He was said to be the model for the quiet American and the ugly American. By the way, am I blocking your view by standing here? Is it better if I stand here? Doesn't matter? Better here? Okay. Better here. Uh, 
said to be the model for the quiet. I'm, I'm probably blocking your view now, right? So I'll, I'll just I'll just go out the door there and just stand outside while you guys watch the slideshow. He was said to be the model for the quiet American and the ugly American. He was written about by pretty much every major author on the subject of the Vietnam War, sometimes in terms laudatory, other times not so laudatory. If you go online, you'll even see a burgeoning conspiracy industry which uh, fingers General Lansdale as the mastermind of the John F. Kennedy assassination, based pretty much entirely on this one photo taken in Dallas, which shows some guy from the rear walking past a couple of policemen and a couple of tramps, and uh, kind of a thin reed upon which to hang a charge of presidential murder. Uh, but this was uh, the, the basis of Oliver Stone's movie JFK, if you can believe that. And just a few weeks ago in Austin, I was debating a, a conspiracy theorist who was convinced that uh, Lansdale really was responsible for the assassination. Well, I would quote to you uh, the words of one of uh, General Lansdale's bureaucratic rivals in the Pentagon, Brute Krulak of the Marine Corps, who said, there are few individuals in my knowledge more damned and at the same time applauded. History is going to have to portray Lansdale's real part. That's where I come in. I am the voice of history in this discussion having devoted the last five years of my life to studying General Lansdale's life. And there's a lot of myths, there's a lot of misunderstandings about him, and so what I've tried to do is to get uh, at the real man. And so who was the real Edward Lansdale? Well, for starters, whoops. Uh, for starters, he was a middle-class kid. He was not to the manor born. He was not one of the wise men who made U.S. foreign policy after World War II. Uh, he did not uh, go to an Ivy League school. He did not spend time on Wall Street very much a middle class kid. There he is with his family. He was born in Detroit in 1908. His father was an automotive executive in the early years of the automobile industry and a number of his employers went bust while he was still working for them and so the family had a very up and down childhood. Although born in Detroit, Lansdale spent most of his youth in California, in LA to be exact, and he became a uh, kind of a quintessential Californian. Very laid back, very mellow, did not like neckties. As you can see, I'm not wearing a necktie in his honor today. Uh, he was kind of a proto-Silicon Valley guy decades before the formation of Silicon Valley. A couple other points worth mentioning very briefly about his upbringing. One is that he uh, uh, was not a great student, and his life should give hope to see students everywhere, uh, but he was a great devotee of the Founding Fathers. He loved to read about the founding, and he was the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution would become his lodestars as an agent of American power in Asia. The other point worth mentioning very briefly is that he uh, grew up at a time of virulent racism, and especially Asian Americans were greatly discriminated against in California in the 19 teens and 20s, but this was not a sentiment that he ever shared. He had a great empathy for minorities and outsiders, in part, I suspect, because he himself was a minority of sorts, even though he was a white middle class American. His family were Christian scientists, and this was a very small religion in his day and one that was very much looked down upon by the mainstream of society. In any case, for whatever reason, he always treated uh, everyone of whatever racial or ethnic group as being entirely his equals, and this too became one of the secrets of his success because when he went to Asia, he did not condescend to the people that he met, unlike so many other Westerners in his day. Now, Lansdale uh, went to UCLA, dropped out a few credits shy of graduation in the early 1930s at the height of the Great Depression, and moved to New York, hoping to become a New Yorker writer or a cartoonist. He did not quite make it. And like a lot of other people with creative aspirations, he wound up in advertising. And this is a picture of Lansdale in his madman days, uh, circa 1940, at his ad agency in San Francisco. And this is one of the ads that they produced. That's actually Lansdale up there in the corner. So he had a flourishing advertising career going, and then uh, his life and the life of the entire country was upended by the day that will live in infamy, December 7th of 1941. With America now at war, he wanted to get into the fight, but found it hard to do so because he was overage and had some medical issues, so the Army would not take him, at least not right away. And so instead of joining the Army, he joined the OSS, America's first civilian intelligence agency. He spent the war years uh, domestically, uh, interviewing travelers who had information about these strange and wondrous places where U.S. troops would shortly be landing from North Africa to the islands of the Pacific. And in the course of doing that, he showed himself to be a very good listener, somebody who was very skilled at eliciting information from people. 
It was only in the fall of 1945, when the war was winding down and millions of GIs were preparing to come home, that Ed Lansdale shipped overseas on his first permanent overseas assignment. By now, he had joined the Army. He was an intelligence officer, and he was deployed to the Philippines in the fall of 1945. This is Lansdale on this very leaky rice boat that he took to survey some of the newly liberated islands of Japan. He was fascinated by everything that he saw around him, not just in Japan, but principally in the Philippines, and wanted to know as much as possible about Filipino culture, folklore, economic conditions, everything he could possibly figure out. He was, of course, particularly interested in the Hook Rebellion, H-U-K, this uh, communist insurgency that was just beginning right after World War II. This is Lansdale in the mid-40s with some captured hooks. Now, by the time that Lansdale arrived in the Philippines in, in 1945, he was already married. In 1933, he had married this woman, Helen, a small-town girl from upstate New York. They had a couple of kids, Ted and Pete. But when he arrived in the Philippines, he met this woman. Whoops. He met this woman, Pat Kelly, this very vivacious Filipina, a war widow. Her late husband, who was of Irish-Filipino ancestry, had died during the war, and she was left to raise a, her daughter by herself. She was working as a journalist and eventually would have a long career at the U.S. Information Agency. And she was of interest to Lansdale initially because she was from the same part of Luzon as many of the Hook leaders. In fact, she had gone to high school with some of them. And so he enlisted her as a guide on these very dangerous trips into the back country of Luzon, into the boondocks, uh, to meet with these communist insurgents. And in the course of these adventures, a friendship developed and before long a romance. And Pat Kelly became the great love of Ed Lansdale's life, something that was not generally known until I began my research. And I was lucky enough to stumble onto these. These were the love letters that Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly exchanged with one another over the course of many years. And I actually was found these by finding uh, Pat Kelly's granddaughter, who actually lives in Northern Virginia. And she invited me over to her house and said, hey, would you be interested in these letters I have in my basement? And I said, boy, would I. I mean, for a uh, biographer, this is like striking gold. Uh, not only did I get my hands on these letters that uh, Ed Lansdale had written to Pat Kelly, but his boys, uh, Ted and Pete, boys now, of course, in their 60s and 70s, living in Florida and New York, shared with me the letters that he had written to their mother, Helen, often simultaneously. So I'm actually the first person after Ed Lansdale himself to have read both sets of letters. And that gives me a vantage point onto Ed Lansdale's innermost thinking that no outsider has ever had before. Uh, one of the things that jumped out at me from uh, doing this research was the extent to which Pat, Lans Pat Kelly was incredibly important to Lansdale, not just personally, although very important personally, but also professionally, because she really gave him an entree and an understanding of Filipino society that's very hard for an outsider to gain. Of course, I also gained some perspective on some of the more awkward episodes of Ed Lansdale's life. For example, what happened in 1947 uh, when his wife Helen and boys Ted and Pete came to live with him in Manila at the very same time that he was still very much seeing Pat Kelly. And it took all, this was one of the more successful covert operations that this uh, future secret agent would carry out to juggle these two women at the same time. He actually came clean with Helen and asked for a divorce, which she did not grant. Very hard at the time to get a contested divorce, so they stayed married. Uh, but he would spend much of the next decade in Asia while she would return home to Washington to raise the kids as a virtual single mother. Now, this initial tour in the Philippines from 1945 to 1948 was very important for Lansdale because it set up his subsequent success, which began at a very dark time in the history of the United States. 1950, you had the Korean War going on. Uh, communists had just taken power in China. The Soviet Union had just acquired atomic weapons. Uh, the Red Scare was rife on the home front, and there was great fear that the Philippines was about to become the next state in Asia to fall to the communists under this man, Louis Taruk, the leader of the Hooks. The Pentagon drew up plans to send multiple army divisions to the Philippines, but they were never implemented because, of course, every soldier was needed in Korea. So instead of sending large U.S. combat formations to the Philippines, the decision was made at the CIA to send Ed Lansdale on a small covert action team, their mission to defeat the Hook Rebellion. This is Lansdale in 1950 at his bungalow in Manila. Uh, that's him at the head of the table. That's his good friend Robert Chaplin, the New Yorker correspondent. 
his eccentric deputy, the uh, former anthropologist, Bo Bohannon, and some of the Filipinos with uh, whom they were working. And this photo is very emblematic of the Lansdale method of operation. He hated formality, he hated bureaucracy, he hated meetings with agendas. What he liked were these kinds of coffee clatches where he could kick back in a very informal environment and brainstorm the ideas that would defeat the Hook Rebellion. Now, the most important thing that Lansdale did was to cultivate this man, Ramon Magsai Sai, who had just been appointed Defense Minister of the Philippines. He was a former guerrilla fighter against the Japanese, a former senator, a honest uh, guy, charismatic, bluff, wanted to do the right thing, but wasn't sure what the right thing was. And that's where Lansdale came in, because he became a virtual one-man brain trust. And together, they would develop the ideas that would come to be known as counterinsurgency doctrine. Lansdale and, and Mog Sai Sai went around the countryside together. They were even roommates for a while. They became as close as brothers. And the essential insight that they had, and really Lansdale had, and, and shared with, with Mog Sai Sai was that the way to defeat the Hook Rebellion was not by using more force, but by using less force. And Lansdale told the Filipino army to stop bombarding barrios with artillery, stop killing a bunch of innocent people because they were creating more enemies than they were eliminating. What he counseled was that the Filipino army should treat the people as brothers, embrace them, protect them, win their trust and confidence, and once the people trust the army, they will rat out the insurgents in their midst. Now, this has become kind of conventional wisdom uh, in, in military circles. This is kind of the essence of, of counterinsurgency doctrine is, Pete Mansour and many others propounded it uh, during the uh, Iraq War, but this wisdom was anything but conventional uh, in the early 1950s when Lansdale was one of the pioneers in developing counterinsurgency doctrine. Now remember that Lansdale was a former advertising man, and so he had a weakness for psychological operations, which is the military version of advertising. And he also knew about a lot about Filipino folklore and culture, and he knew about the myths about the Aswang, these vampires, who were said to haunt the Philippine countryside. And so Lansdale decided to mobilize the Aswang against the hooks. And he did this by having a Philippine army unit take a dead hook and put a couple of puncture wounds into his neck and then spread the rumor that he'd been killed by a vampire, thereby mobilizing, putting the fear of, of, of the supernatural into the hooks. And this became a big part of the Lansdale legend. At CIA headquarters, people would say, can you believe what this guy Lansdale is doing out there in the Philippines. He's mobilizing vampires. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to give you the impression that the way he defeated the hooks was with these dirty tricks or these cute psychological operations. It really came down to politics 101. Lansdale understood that the hook slogan was bullets, not ballots. And why bullets, not ballots? Because people didn't trust the ballots. They knew that the elections were rigged. There was this feudal landowning oligarchy in the Philippines that controlled economic and political power, and these poor dispossessed farmers did not have a chance to make their voice heard. So Lansdale understood that to defeat the Hook Rebellion, he had to give the people confidence in their political system. So he mobilized uh, a bunch of Filipino civic organizations to safeguard the balloting process. His masterpiece was the 1953 Filipino presidential election. And if any of you are interested in running a political campaign in the developing world, I would strongly recommend to you the memo, the top secret memo that Ed Lansdale wrote to his boss, CIA Director Alan Dulles, explaining how he won the 1953 election. And it wasn't anything illegal or underhanded. It was really politics 101, doing things like coming up with a campaign slogan for Mog Sai Sai, which in case you're wondering was, Mog Sai Sai is my guy. And so Mog Sai Sai became known as the guy throughout the Philippines. So with a combination of Lansdale's political skill and uh, Mike Sai Sai's own charm and his reputation as an honest reformer, he won a landslide victory in 1953, and here you see him being inaugurated as president. Lansdale, in the course of that, earned a new nickname. He became known as Colonel Landslide. So when Colonel Landslide went home to Washington, he was pretty much the flavor of the month with his boss, CIA Director Alan Dulles. This was seen as being one of the great, and it really was one of the great Cold War wins for the United States, which had been achieved without risking a single American soldier in battle, entirely through the work of Ed Lansdale and his small advisory team. Now, this became of considerable importance because at that very moment, another crisis in another Southeast Asian country was breaking out. 
1954 was the year of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. And by the way, this was a photo that I took at the relatively new museum at Dien Bien Phu, which if you happen to find yourselves in northern Vietnam, I would highly recommend. Uh, but in 1954, Dien Bien Phu was not a historical curiosity in Washington. It was seen as a major threat to American interests. With the French losing at Dien Bien Phu, there was great fear that all of Indochina was about to go communist, and then after that, all of Asia with the domino theory. At the Geneva Conference, uh, Vietnam was divided into two. You had North Vietnam, which would be ruled by Ho Chi Minh and the communists, and then you had South Vietnam, uh, which was supposed to be a non-communist state. But how do you create a non-communist state where none had ever existed? Well, when Alan Dulles and his brother, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, were discussing this vexing issue, they decided, well, why don't we send Landslide Lansdale to Saigon and see what he can do? And so it was that in the summer of 1954, Ed Lansdale found himself in Saigon. His mission, as given to him by Alan Dulles, was do what you did in the Philippines. And remarkably enough, he did. The first thing he did was to cultivate a new protege, just as he had cultivated Ramon Magsai Sai in the Philippines. In South Vietnam, he began to work with the newly appointed prime minister of the state of South Vietnam, No Din Ziem. Uh, Ziem was a Catholic Confucian Mandarin, a former minister under the French who had quit in disgust, and so he had credentials as both an anti-communist as well as an anti-colonialist. But in the summer of 1954, very few people expected that he would last nine weeks in power, much less nine years. The fact that he was able to consolidate his authority owed a lot to the kind of expert guidance that he received from Ed Lansdale. Now, it wasn't as easy for Lansdale to cultivate CM as it had been with, with Magsai Sai. This is uh, Lansdale there, that's Magsai Sai over there. For one thing, there was a language barrier. Although Lansdale had a genius for winning over foreigners, he was a typical American in that he only spoke English. Now that wasn't a big problem in the Philippines where the elite spoke English. It was a bigger problem in Vietnam where in the 50s the elite spoke French or Vietnamese. And so Lansdale had to work through a translator. But even working through a translator, he was tremendously effective in ingratiating himself to ZM. How did he do it? Very simple. He listened rather than lectured. Now when we Westerners go to the developing world, we love to tell people what to do. That wasn't the Lansdale approach at all. And he was a great listener, and that, wasn't, that was not easy to do in the case of somebody like ZM, who was a notorious windbag. Uh, ZM would go on for hour after hour and bore the pants off of most of his American interlocutors. But Lansdale was made of sterner stuff and probably had a stronger bladder uh, because <laughs> he would sit there for hour after hour listening to ZM drone on. And at the end of that time, he would say, well, that's fascinating, Mr. Prime Minister. If I understand what you're saying, it's X, Y, and Z. And then he would rephrase what Ziem had told him, putting across his own ideas and making Ziem think that he had thought of it himself. Now, that's a pretty subtle but pretty effective method of operating. It works with bosses. It works with spouses. Uh, and it definitely works with foreign heads of state. I, can, I can't recommend it strongly enough. And so that was the method by which Lansdale won over Ziem and won his support for this very ambitious uh, program of pacification uh, that, he, uh, that he undertook, including Operation Passage to Freedom, uh, enlisting the U.S. Navy to move more than 900,000 refugees from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, thereby greatly strengthening the state of South Vietnam. And of course, Lansdale being Lansdale, there had to be a psychological warfare component to the operation. For example, hiring a soothsayer to predict bad fortune for North Vietnam and good fortune for South Vietnam. Also, uh, there was a civic action component, uh, Operation Brotherhood, uh, bringing over Filipino doctors and nurses to provide medical care free of charge to the people of South Vietnam in order to win them over for the government. Now, the fact that Lansdale was a CIA officer, he was by this point, he was an Air Force officer, Air Force Colonel on loan to the CIA. The fact that he was doing all these things was controversial within many uh, quarters of the U.S. government. There were a lot of people who didn't think that a CIA officer should be engaged in all of this nation building. And among his critics was his own boss, General Lightning Joe Collins, who was a great hero of World War II, one of the few, maybe the only U.S. General Pete who fought in both the European and Pacific theaters of operation. Yeah, very few. 
uh, became a four-star general, army chief of staff, friend of President Eisenhower, who was sent out to Saigon as, as ambassador. Now, Lightning Joe Collins was a great conventional war soldier, but he did not quite have the mindset for unconventional warfare in Southeast Asia, and so he and Lansdale clashed from their very first country team meeting. La uh, Collins said he wanted to reduce the size of the South Vietnamese Army because it was costing too much. Lansdale objected. He said, you know, uh, the Viet Minh, the communist insurgents, are vacating large chunks of the South Vietnamese countryside, and somebody's got to go in there and provide government, and the only part of the South Vietnamese government that functions is the Army, so you can't really downsize them. And plus, oh, by the way, there are all these sect militia forces running around South Vietnam. They have to be demobilized and incorporated into the Army, otherwise you're never going to have a functioning state. Well, General Collins listened to him for a little bit and said, finally, you know, I'm here as the personal representative of the President of the United States. That's enough, mister. Have a seat. He wasn't interested in more debate. Well, at that point, you know, most colonels have told to have a seat by a four-star general would in fact have a seat. But Lansdale was not most colonels. He was an inveterate troublemaker and maverick. So instead of having a seat, he got up and said, Sir, you may be here as a personal representative of the President of the United States, but I am convinced if the people of the United States could hear what you had to say, they would disagree with you. And I'm here to speak up on behalf of the people of the United States. And on behalf of the people of the United States, we're walking out on you. And out he walked out the door. Uh, now, don't try this at home. Uh, it's, probably, it's probably not going to do your career too much good. Uh, the fact that Lansdale got away with it is a testament to the fact that he had protectors even more powerful than four-star generals. He was under the direct patronage of the Dulles brothers, who were the true king, kingmakers in President Eisenhower's uh, Washington. And that allowed him to override even General Collins, which became of considerable importance during the major crisis of ZM's consolidation of power which occurred in the spring of 1955, the Battle for Saigon, when at Lansdale's urging ZM sent the South, South Vietnamese Army into the streets of the capital uh, to break the hold of these sect military forces that were challenging the central government. It was touch and go. Uh, it was a very difficult street battle. Could have gone either way. General Collins wanted to abandon ZM in the middle of that fight, but Lansdale went over his head straight to Alan Dulles, who in turn went to President Eisenhower and overruled Collins. And so ZM was able to maintain U.S. support throughout the crisis, and with that support, his army was able to break the back of the sect military forces. By 1956, uh, the end of 1956, when Lansdale was getting ready to go home, ZM looked like he was pretty well consolidated in power. And this is ZM touring a part of the provinces that had been pacified at Lansdale's direction. He was seen in Washington as being one of the great uh, counter uh, one of the great anti-communist success stories in East Asia, a bulwark of nationalism along with Ramon Magsaysay. ZM got a ticker tape parade on Broadway. He was seen as a great American ally. And when Ed Lansdale finally came home at the beginning of 1957, he was held in even higher repute than ever among those select few people who had the top secret clearances to know what he had done. And this is Lansdale receiving a medal from Vice President Nixon as his wife Helen looks on. By the late 1950s, early 1960s, Lansdale was becoming one of the least secret secret agents on the planet. He was actually becoming pretty well known. He was said to be the model for Graham Greene's The Quiet American, and he was definitely the model uh, for one of the positive characters in The Ugly American. He was acquiring all sorts of nicknames, like the T. Lawrence of Asia and the American James Bond. When the Kennedy administration came into power, they were quite enamored of, of Lansdale, who was seen as this can-do covert action operative so enamored of him, in fact, that they gave him their top foreign policy priority. And what was the Kennedy administration's top priority? It was overthrowing Fidel Castro, because the, the Kennedy administration had begun uh, with the fiasco at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and the, in, in the view of the Kennedys, Castro had humiliated Jack Kennedy, and he needed to pay a price for that. They were going to get rid of Castro, overthrow him, kill him. They didn't really care. They just wanted him gone. But they had lost faith in the CIA which had been behind the Bay of Pigs, which Operation Lansdale had criticized. So instead of turning to the agency, the Kennedys turned to the American James Bond. And at the end of 1961, Lansdale was assigned as operations director for Operation Mongoose, the interagency effort to overthrow or kill Fidel Castro. Now, you very quickly ascertained that the only way you were going to get rid of Castro in short order 
was with an American military invasion. But the Kennedys didn't want to invade Cuba. What they wanted was some kind of covert action gimmick that would allow them to overthrow Castro at scant risk to themselves. And so Lansdale spent much of 1962 trying to come up with that gimmick. And the result was stuff like this. This was a CIA propaganda poster uh, featuring Gusano Libra, free worm, uh, because Castro called his enemies worms, and so the CIA was going to turn that moniker against them and to make free worm the symbol of the Cuban resistance. And this is free worm cutting power lines somewhere in Cuba. Now, you have to admit that this is undoubtedly the cutest mascot that any insurgency has ever had, uh, but it wasn't very, very uh, effective. The only thing that Operation Mongoose achieved was it generated the intelligence which alerted policymakers in Washington that uh, Nikita Khrushchev was placing nuclear missiles into Cuba. But after the conclusion of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, Operation Mongoose was disbanded. Ed Lansdale lost the favor of the Kennedys, and he was essentially left naked and helpless before his many bureaucratic enemies, of whom the most important was his own boss, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Two very different characters, McNamara and Lansdale. McNamara was academically brilliant. He had come over to the Pentagon from the, running the Ford Motor Company, graduate of the Harvard Business School, and full disclosure, also a graduate of my alma mater, UC Berkeley. He was enamored of numbers and systems analysis, thought that these computer equations held all the answers to, to, to the most vexing issues of war and peace. Lansdale, not so academically gifted, UCLA dropout, but he had spent years in Southeast Asia. And so when uh, McNamara took office in 1961, Lansdale tried to begin his education in this new war just beginning in South Vietnam. Lansdale had just returned from South Vietnam, and he brought with him some captured Viet Cong weaponry, some very simple pistols and rifles and stakes and so forth, all covered in mud and blood. And he walked into McNamara's palatial office and dumped a load of dirty weapons on McNamara's immaculate desk. And he said, Mr. Secretary, these are the weapons that are being used by our enemies in Vietnam. They're not very sophisticated. And the people who are using them, you wouldn't even recognize them as soldiers. They wear black pajamas and rubber sandals. But they're licking the troops on our side because they have something that we don't, the power of an ideal, the power of an idea. And the only way we're going to defeat them is if we give a more powerful idea or ideal to the soldiers of South Vietnam. We're not going to bomb this revolution into oblivion. In hindsight, pretty wise advice, but McNamara was invincibly armored in his ignorance and arrogance and chose to disregard what Ed Lansdale had to say. By 1963, Lansdale was completely without influence on America policy towards Vietnam, even as it was reaching a critical phase. 1963 was the year of the Buddhist revolt. You had this militant Buddhist movement uh, rising up against Ziem and his Catholic regime. You had Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire in the streets of Saigon. This convinced the Kennedy administration that the only way to defeat communism in South Vietnam was to overthrow Ziem, to back a military coup against him. Lansdale warned against this. He said, I know Ziem, I know he's imperfect, but we can work with him. He's the least bad alternative that there is. And he added, I also know the generals. I know they're going to be far less legitimate, far less effective, far more corrupt than, Lans than Ziem has been. But Lansdale's advice was tragically disregarded. And at the beginning of November 1963, coincidentally on the very day when Lansdale was being retired from the Pentagon as a two-star general, the military coup went ahead. Within 24 hours, No Din Ziem and his brother No Din Nu had been murdered. And the consequences were every bit as disastrous as Lansdale had predicted. The Viet Cong stepped up their infiltrations. They called the, the, the death of Ziem a heaven-sent gift for us. Uh, the government of South Vietnam fell apart. You had military coup after military coup. The entire country was destabilized. And so it was that by 1965, Lyndon Johnson decided that the only way to save South Vietnam was by bombing North Vietnam and sending American combat troops into the South. This was a decision that Lansdale opposed. He thought that we should help the people of South Vietnam, but he thought they needed to take the lead in their own defense. He opposed Americanizing the war effort. But again, he was disregarded. In 1965, Lansdale returned to Saigon to try to salvage what he already saw as a losing situation. This is him arriving on the tarmac in Saigon uh, as a, now as a, as a uh, diplomatic rather than military official. 
working at the embassy for Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. This was not a marriage made in heaven. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge had also been the ambassador in 1963, who had overseen the overthrow and murder of Lansdale's friend, No Din Ziem. Now, in the 1950s, Lansdale had no problem overriding mere ambassadors. The problem in the 1960s was he did not have the same kind of high-level pull in Washington. His highest-level defender in the Johnson administration was Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who was quite enthusiastic about Lansdale, but Hubert Humphrey was also almost powerless to affect the decision-making of President Johnson. Just as he had done previously, Lansdale also tried to cultivate a powerful local protege, and he tried to work with Win Cao Ki, this very flashy Air Force Vice Marshal who became uh, Prime Minister and then Vice President of the State of South Vietnam, but Ki lost a power struggle to an Army General named Win Van Tu, who eventually emerged as the dominant strongman of the military junta. And so in the 1960s, Lansdale lacked both a powerful protector in Washington and a powerful protege on the ground in Saigon. Therefore, he was left as a helpless bystander as the American war effort careened along its conventional big unit course. General Westmoreland genuinely believed that he could kill the Viet Cong faster than they could be replaced. Lansdale told him this was an illusion. It was never going to work. The only way to win was to stand up a stable, legitimate, and popular government in Saigon that could command the allegiance of the South Vietnamese people. He was ignored. And so finally, in 1968, his advice became unignorable with the Tet Offensive. Lansdale immediately perceived that the Tet Offensive was not this great military victory that General Westmoreland claimed it was. It was, in fact, a crippling psychological blow that destroyed American public opinion, American public support uh, for the war in Vietnam. By the time that Lansdale left Vietnam for the last time in the summer of 1968, he was feeling very much dejected defeated and demoralized. He knew that the war was being lost. And he was not terribly surprised when a few years later, in April of 1975, North Vietnam invaded and very quickly occupied the husk of a state. Now, the question that I raise in my book, the reason it's called The Road Not Taken, is what would have happened if Lansdale had been listened to? Well, I certainly can't stand here and tell you uh, that everything would have been great. We would have won the war. Everything in South Vietnam would still continue to exist. I mean, it's possible that would have happened, but we just don't know. Uh, in any case, Vietnam, no matter what Ed Lansdale did, North Vietnam was going to be a formidable adversary with greater will to win than we had. So it's quite possible that even if we had still listened to Ed Lansdale, we would have still lost. But at the very least, even if we had still lost, we would not have lost 58,000 Americans. We would not have had millions of Vietnamese killed in the crossfire because Ed Lansdale never wanted to fight this conventional big unit war in the first place. And he was haunted to the end of his days by this sense of tragedy and failure, these what-ifs and might-have-beens, what if he had been listened to. His professional career ended in ruin. He did, however, find a little bit of happiness in his personal life. After his first wife, Helen, died, uh, Pat Kelly, uh, who was still unmarried, just retired from the U.S. Embassy in Manila, moved to Washington. And on July 4th of 1973, Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly got hitched. And this is them in the home of their, in the kitchen of their home in Northern Virginia, where they lived happily ever after, until Lansdale's own demise from natural causes in 1987. I have to say that after having studied Lansdale's life for the last five years, it was a very moving experience for me to visit his grave at Arlington National Cemetery. I felt like I really knew the guy in some ways better than I know my own father, which in part is a testament to my relationship with my father, uh, but is also a testament to the extent to which I delved into Lansdale's life. And I tried to tell that life story as well as I could and took directions I didn't expect. I knew it was going to be a story of the Vietnam War. I didn't quite anticipate the extent to which it would also be an adventure story, a spy story, and above all, a romance. And you know, I'm a knuckle-dragging military historian, so I did not expect to be writing what I found to be this very moving romance uh, between Ed Lansdale and, and Pat Kelly. And that's a central feature of the book. Now, the last point that I would make is I think that while Ed Lansdale's story is intrinsically interesting, uh, it does have some relevance for the present day because, of course, today we are engaged in another great counterinsurgency, this time not against communist insurgents as in Lansdale's day, but against Islamist insurgents. And if we're going to win the war against uh, Islamist insurgents, how are we going to do it? 
Well, I would submit we're probably not going to do it with American combat troops. We're not going to send large numbers of American soldiers to occupy the greater Middle East. Been there, done that, tried it, didn't like it. Probably not going to do it again anytime soon. So if we're not going to win the war on terror with American combat troops, how are we going to win it? If, in fact, we win it, I would submit uh, with American advisors, with small teams of diplomatic intelligence and military personnel fanning out to these frontline states to work with them to combat our mutual enemies, much as we did recently in the battle against Islamic State. And if you think about advisors, you have to think about Ed Lansdale, who is one of the most storied and successful advisors of the 20th century, right up there with T. Lawrence. I think he has a lot of lessons to teach, both good and bad. They're not all positive. This is not a hagiography. I, I go into a lot of his faults and mistakes as well. But I do think he got one big thing right, which is worth keeping in mind, which is that he figured out how to weaponize empathy. He figured out how to send emotional intelligence marching into battle. He used his ability to connect with foreign leaders to be a very powerful instrument of American foreign policy, to persuade them instead of to beat them over the head. And so that's a model that I think we should think about as we think about the future of American grand strategy. So with that, let me stop talking at you, and I'd love to hear your, your questions or comments or cat calls or what have you. Let there be light. I have brought, let it be recorded, I have brought light onto this world. John Muller. He wasn't. I mean, uh, that was the course taken by one of his protégés, uh, a fellow you might have heard of named Dan Ellsberg, uh, who got his start working for Lansdale in Vietnam in 65. In fact, for those of you who have seen the movie The Post, which I would recommend, you guys seen it? Uh, I was tickled to see that the very first lines of dialogue in the movie are one Marine says to the other, who's the long hair? And the other Marine says, that's Ellsberg. He works for Lansdale at the embassy. Now, I'm sure nine out of ten moviegoers had no idea who this Lansdale was, but I knew. Uh, and uh, Ellsberg didn't, as a former RAND analyst, did indeed get a start in Vietnam with, 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 with Lansdale. And he was, in 65, he was a former Marine, for, former RAND analyst, a shoot him dead super hawk who, who went into the bush with his own little submachine gun to go get the VC himself. Uh, and then he turned around, and within a few years he came home and went from being this super hot to being the super dove who was denouncing everybody involved in Vietnam policy as a war criminal. And of course, he wound up leaking the Pentagon Papers, which greatly embarrassed Ed Lansdale because a lot of the Pentagon Papers were about Ed Lansdale. Uh, but nevertheless, Ed Lansdale and, and Dan Ellsberg remained on good terms. And I talked to Dan Ellsberg about Ed Lansdale a few years ago, and he said, I love the man, and I love him still. He had great respect for him. Uh, but he did, Lansdale did not go the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Ellsberg route of, of joining the anti-war movement. But he wasn't a conventional hawk either. He was like John Paul Van and a few others. He was kind of outside the conventional political spectrum because he certainly did not agree with the conventional hawks, people like Curtis LeMay, you know, who said we need to bond North Vietnam into the Stone Age. And you, know, you had this prevailing myth among many political conservatives in, in the military, that if only we'd used more force, if we hadn't fought with one arm behind our back, et cetera, we would have won the war, which, you know, Ed Lansdale thought was ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous because, in fact, we dropped more bombs in Vietnam than we had in World War II. We used plenty of force, and it didn't avail us much. So Lansdale was opposed to that kind of hawkish critique of the war, but he was also, he couldn't associate himself with the doves either because he was very passionately and closely attached to, to the people of South Vietnam. He did not want to abandon them to the communists. He wanted to try to help them help themselves. And so he basically wound up as this kind of odd man out in the political debate, a man without a constituency. Now, you asked about the other road not taken, kind of an obvious one in hindsight, which is not getting involved in Vietnam in the first place. And I have to admit, with the benefit of hindsight, that looks like a pretty alluring option. Because if you had known in you know 1954 that we were going to get mixed up in Vietnam and lose 58,000 Americans, have millions of Vietnamese killed, and we were still going to lose 
We were going to divide the home front. We were going to create this catastrophe in Vietnam and, and in America. Yeah, I mean, the counsel of wisdom is to say, let's not get involved. But of course, uh, very few people uh, in U.S. policy circles in the 1950s were saying any such thing because, as you know, the dominant theory at the time was the domino theory, the notion that if the communists took power in Indochina, then it would be Thailand and Malaysia, Indonesia, and pretty soon all of Asia would fall to the communists. And, of course, in hindsight, it's possible to say that's ridiculous. But it, I would say it's not 100% ridiculous because at least a couple of dominoes did fall when South Vietnam fell. You had Laos and Cambodia. You had the killing fields in Cambodia. Over 2 million people killed. You had hundreds of thousands of refugees and boat people and re-education camps in Vietnam. And, you know, for what it's worth, Lee Kuan Yew later said that he thought that the American war effort in Vietnam had bought time for the other states in Southeast Asia to strengthen their governments and prevent communist takeovers. I mean, again, who knows? And in, in hindsight, obviously none of that was worth the cost of 58,000 dead Americans. But this was not the Lansdale position in the 1950s, and you can certainly fault him for being kind of part of the mainstream mindset, which held that we should defend South Vietnam. He just had a different way of going about it. But again, as I stressed, if we had followed the Ed Lansdale advice, even if we'd still lost, there would not have been a loss on this kind of epic and, and terrible scale. Sir? Um, in my reading of Vietnamese history and also the Southeast Asian history of the period, the really big idea was national, anti-colonial nationalism. Um, it was so important to the victory of the Viet Minh, Viet Cong, and so forth in Vietnam in that period that it really vitiates any possibility that Colonel Lansdale might have made a difference. Any arguments that he had uh, with Secretary McNamara and so forth, they're all arguing irrelevant uh, kind of argument. Um, have you looked, in thinking about focusing on writing a whole book, spending all the time involved in writing about Lansdale, have you thought about putting it in that larger context? And it, if, if I had, if I were going to write a history of the period, I think I would pretty quickly discard Colonel Lansdale and say, okay, this is a kind of interesting romantic figure of this period, but if we really want to understand how Vietnam became communist, we have to look at it in the context of nationalism. Well, you're welcome to write that book. I chose to write a book about, about Ed Lansdale. Um, and I did not disregard the power of nationalism. I can assure you, certainly Ed Lansdale did not disregard the power of nationalism. He was keenly aware of it. For example, in 1953, when he first visited Vietnam as part of this American advisory mission, uh, he surveyed the French war effort, met, went all over the country, met with French troops, and he very quickly ascertained that the French were going to lose because they did not have a political end state that the people of South Vietnam would support because they were fighting for a continuation of French colonial rule. He knew that wasn't going to work. And that's part of the reason why he was so determined when the French left that we not replace them with this massive American military establishment. And that was one of his complaints, that this vast American apparatus gave the impression that we were a new generation of colonialists replacing the French, whereas, in fact, he was determined to uh, have as small of an American footprint as possible to have the Americans recede into the background to put the Vietnamese front and center. And if there were going to be foreigners there, he tried to bring over as many Filipinos as possible so as to give the aid that the South Vietnamese were getting an Asian uh, face instead of having uh, gringos be on taking over everything. So he was very conscious of the, of, of the needs of nationalism. But I would push back a little bit against your thesis because if I understood what you were saying, and this is obviously a complex debate, um, you know, there are people who said at the time and say now, that the forces of Vietnamese nationalism dictated uh, that Ho Chi Minh and, and, and the communists, or really Les Zuan, who was the key decision maker in North Vietnam in the 60s, not Ho Chi Minh, but that the Vietnamese communists were going to win because they had, def as the Viet Minh, they had defeated the French. They had legitimacy as these great nationalist heroes. And all, it's, it's true. I mean, Ho Chi Minh had great legitimacy as a nationalist hero, no question about it. Uh, but I would push back against the thesis that the communists had entirely captured the nationalist movement in Vietnam. They certainly tried to do that. And when Ho Chi Minh and the communists took power in North Vietnam, they killed a lot of anti-communist nationalists whom they saw as a threat to their rule. But in fact, I mean, if the way I read the, the historiography is uh, there was always, a, you know, the Vietnam War was really this 30-year civil war 
pitting communist versus non-communist nationalists. And of course, both sides had their outside sponsors with the non-communist sponsored uh, initially uh, by the French and then by us, and then of course, the communists sponsored by China and the Soviet Union. Uh, but, and so it's easy in hindsight to say it was inevitable that the communist nationalists would win. I don't think it was necessarily inevitable. I think you had you know, a similar battle, for example, in Korea between communists and non-communist Korean nationalists, which essentially ended in a draw which continues to this day. I don't think it was utterly impossible to imagine that such a thing could have occurred in South Vietnam. Uh, but uh, because I think there was a genuine nationalist, non-communist movement. And the people of South Vietnam, to be fair, there was never a mass uprising uh, or any enthusiasm for a communist takeover. In fact, Les Juan and the architects of the Tet Offensive imagined that there would be this general uprising and that as soon as the Viet Cong troops emerged uh, from hiding, that the people of South Vietnam would rise up and cast out these imperialist and running dog uh, feudalists and so forth. And it didn't happen. The people of South Vietnam did not vote for a communist takeover. They were ultimately conquered by an armored invasion in 1975. That doesn't mean that they were very enthusiastic about the government they had because it was basically also illegitimate and dictatorial and not very popular, but they basically were caught in the middle. And, and so Lionsdale was acutely aware of that, and he kept saying, you know, you have to reform the government of South Vietnam to make it less dictatorial, more popular, and more legitimate to compete for hearts and minds in the people among the people of South Vietnam. And he thought that that was possible to do, but his advice was disregarded, and so you know, we just don't know. But, and so in hindsight, it's easy to say that, it, you know, the communist victory was inevitable. But I would say, you know, other than death and taxes, very few things that are inevitable in life. Sir? I look forward to reading the book. It's, it's on my wait till summer list. Uh, I'm really interested in Lansdale's relationship with Jim. Um, in his, his memoir, he has a uh, really great description of the first time he saw Jim coming from the airport. He's in a Right. And it's a metaphor for Jim's remoteness from popular politics. If I remember the, the passage right, he says um, that I made my way right to the presidential palace to try to tell him what he needs to do. And it's pretty obvious that, that Jim never quite got the head of popular politics, that he never uh, uh, surrendered his aloofness. And so I'm wondering about the, the years in the late 50s and the early 60s uh, where Lansdale wasn't Well, these are all good questions. Glad you read uh, Lansdale's memoir, uh, an interesting document, although kind of deliberately deceptive and, and, and not very revealing. But that was a vivid passage when ZM first arrived in, in, in Saigon in the summer of 54. Lansdale had arrived a few weeks before. Um, I think it's fair to say that ZM was not a natural politician. He was kind of a recru reclusive, shy, bookish figure. He was also, by the way, not corrupt. I mean, that's one of the myths about him but he was actually very ascetic, so he was not on the take, unlike future leaders of South Vietnam. Uh, but he was certainly not a man of the people. He had this kind of Mandarin ethos of, of that of the scholarly elite should rule by, by, by their greater virtue. Uh, he, did not, he was not a natural democratic politician in the way that Mog Tsai Tsai was. And ZM and, and Lansdale tried to push him in that direction. You know, he pushed him to get out of the palace, to go out among the people. I showed you the photo of him. Uh, with adoring crowds in the countryside. That wasn't something he did of his own volition. That was because, you know, Lansdale practically uh, shoved him on the airplane and sent him out there uh, and said, you've got to meet the people. He pushed him to meet with opposition leaders to do all these other things that were very uncomfortable for him and also to curb his dictatorial tendencies. And they had big debates, especially in 1956, over the nature of South Vietnamese government. And Lansdale kept saying that he needed to be uh, more democratic and more inclusive and, and less authoritarian, and ZM was not very happy about that. And Lansdale had trouble making his views stick because in this case, he did not have the support of Washington. The Dulles brothers were not very sympathetic to that argument. And then Lansdale left at the end of 1956, and he and, and the U.S. kind of lost uh, most of their leverage over, over ZM. 
Uh, at that point, the dominant figure became his brother, No Nu, who was this conspiratorial, fascist, French-educated guy uh, who wanted to establish this kind of Mussolini-like state in, in South Vietnam. And Lansdale was very perturbed about that because he said, you know, you're going to have some initial success. You're going to be able to lock up a lot of communists, but you're also locking up a lot of non-communists, and you're turning a lot of people who might be, uh, who might be the, the moderate opposition, you're, turning, you're driving them into the arms of the communist rebellion, so please don't do this. And he was ignored because he was back in Washington. He couldn't get back to Saigon because of all these bureaucratic rivals who blocked him from doing that. And people in the U.S. government were pretty complacent. I mean, in some ways, I would say this was kind of like what happened in Iraq after around 2011 when we thought we'd quote-unquote won, and so we didn't need to do too much more. We could pull out. There was kind of a similar mindset in Vietnam after 56, the notion being that CM was consolidated. And so the CIA, for example, didn't feel compelled to send another advisor to take Lansdale's place as a confidant of ZM. As soon as Lansdale left, the CIA station kind of reverted back to their comfort zone, which was paying off a cleaning lady in the presidential palace to steal ZM's trash basket, a waste paper basket, and take it to the station for analysis. That was how the CIA liked to roll then. They still like to roll that way today. Uh, and Lansdale, <laughs> Lansdale thought this was ridiculous because when he wanted to find out what ZM was thinking, he didn't need to steal his trash. He would go and ask him, and ZM would probably tell him a lot more than you could find out by reading his trash. But this was kind of the dominant mindset was, you know, we don't have to worry about influencing this guy. He's just like a normal head of state. And so because of that, uh, ZM drifted further into authoritarianism, and it ultimately ended in tragedy with that confrontation with the Buddhists in 1963. Uh, Walt Rostow, who eventually, as you know, became Johnson's national security advisor, said that, you know, this was perhaps the last chance to, to prevent the American war in Vietnam, was to send Ed Lansdale out to Saigon in 1963 to edge aside Ngo Dinh and to uh, get ZM to reach out to the Buddhists, conciliate with them, and avert this crisis that led to the regime's overthrow. But again, it didn't happen because people like Dean Rusk and Robert McNamara were totally opposed to sending Lansdale out there. And so, yeah, I mean, you can argue that things like started going south, as, you know, basically the second that Lansdale left South Vietnam in 1956. And of course, a lot of the intrinsic problem was ZM himself, who was not a very inspirational figure. But I, Lansdale's view was that you can keep the, you could you could sort of nudge him along and keep him within certain parameters if you applied a lot of pressure to him. But then if you let him go for a bunch of years, then things are not going to work out. And we basically let him go. And but I mean I think we've had similar problems by the way with with people like Hamid Karzai and Uriel Maliki in recent years. The other part of the question was what land, who was Lansdale talking to as they were plotting the coup? Oh well, by 1963 there was almost nobody he could talk to because he was cut out of of policy making. I mean he got wind of what was going on. He tried to talk to people like Avril Harriman, who was then the Under Secretary of State and one of the big proponents of overthrowing ZM, but they wouldn't really engage with him. Michael Forrestal, the NSC staff. They didn't really want to hear from him, and so he was based. He was not in the NSC meetings where this issue was debated. Yeah. Um, the quiet approach with advisors seems to be what the U.S. is taking with Boko Haram in Africa. Um, I wondered if you could comment on the how effective you think that's been, and in particular, if it needs to be quiet. We've seen recently with the death of the soldiers, I think in Niger, that the public opinion. Was kind of surprised pushing back a bit. Um, and related to that, the contrast you said is with the big machinery approach. Um, with the document the USS Carl Vinson this week in Benin, um, I wondered if you'd comment on the, the current administration's strategy. Well, I, I'll comment a little bit broader than, than Boko Haram. I have to admit, I'm not actually an expert on Boko Haram, but I, I'm, I can opine more generally about the war on terror, which is that. I mean, we are trying to do some of these things uh, with these small advisory teams, but I would say that our main line of operations is, is, is still largely kinetic. It's uh, drone strikes and commando raids taking out terrorist uh, leaders, and what we can cons pretty consistently find is that we can kill insurgents, but we can't eliminate insurgencies. And I think this is, I mean, this is the fundamental problem that we face, whether it's in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Nigeria, Somalia, Libya, na name a country. The reason why all these countries are still generating uh, insurgents to replace the one we or our allies have eliminated is because there's not really a stable political end state there. And as long as they remain in turmoil and plagued by bad government, they're going to continue generating 
uh, insurgents. I mean, in, in my view, just from having done my previous book on 5,000 years of guerrilla warfare history, the number one cause of insurgency is bad government. So as long as you have bad government, you're going to have insurgents. And, you know, we can kind of mow the lawn and try to contain the problem with these, uh, with these decapitation strikes, but it's not going to really fix the issue. And that's, and it's, and uh, we can't, of course, we can't just sit here and snap our fingers and fix the issue. It requires very hard work, but I think we could use an army of Ed Lansdales who can fan out to these places and really exercise uh, influence and, 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 and be deeply knowledgeable in the local situation. That's often not the case because often we're rotating people through in six months, one year, two years, whatever, who don't necessarily have the relationships or the deep background in those areas to be truly influential. And that's, I think that's a big problem with our personnel and, and, and bureaucracy, and inter personnel system and bureaucracy. So we don't necessarily have people in the mold of a, of a T. Lawrence or an Ed Lansdale who can really influence uh, the locals. Uh, your other question was about the docking of the USS Carl Vinson in Da Nang, right? Uh, fascinating moment. I wanted to, who would have ever thunk it in, in 1975 that, you know, of course, Da Nang was where the first U.S. combat troops landed in 1965, the Marines. And now, symbolically, the, the Carl Vinson is back and, and, and not as a, uh, as a bringer of war, but as a cementer of this newfound friendship with, with Vietnam, which, of course, sees us as a as a valuable ally against uh, Chinese domination. So, you know, uh, certainly a road that Lansdale could not have expected, and the fact that Vietnam today is, is following this market Leninist reform model that, that China has previously followed, uh, where, of course, they still remain a communist dictatorship, but uh, there's much more openness to free enterprise. I mean, they're still jailing bloggers, but uh, it's, it's a much more open society than it used to be. And of course, one of the fascinating things for me as an American visiting Vietnam is to the extent to which people are largely pro-American. Of course, you know, they're a uh, very young population, very few people remember the war. Uh, and so despite decades of propaganda in the Museum of American War Atrocities in Ho Chi Minh City, which has since been renamed, people are generally have a very favorable outlook on the United States. And so it's, you know, it's very easy to say, of course, in hindsight, well, what the hell were we fighting for? Uh, we lost and things worked out pretty well anyway, and, and that's true on some level, but of course uh, there was a huge cost and, and, and a huge detour along the road. You know, when you think about the cost of the communist victory with the hundreds of thousands of people in re-education, i.e. concentration camps, hundreds of thousands of boat people, the takeover in, in, in Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, the killing fields, over two million killed, and then of course there were decades of, of very strict uh, you know, quasi-Stalinist rule before this thaw occurred. Uh, it's striking to me, one of the things that strikes me about traveling to Vietnam is the extent to which Ho Chi Minh City, a.k.a. Saigon, is still seems to me a much more bustling and vibrant place than Hanoi, which in some ways makes Hanoi a more interesting place to visit as an outsider because it's more of a museum, it's got the colonial influence, you can, you can see the history, whereas, you know, Ho Chi Minh City is kind of this generic bustling Asian megacity. But it's striking to me the extent to which you still have this amazing entrepreneurial energy in the South, more so it seems to me than in the North. And it does make you wonder, like, well, what if, what if South Vietnam could have survived? You know, it probably could have been like South Korea or, or Taiwan, another Asian tiger, democ democratic and free market by this point, American ally. Didn't quite happen, but, you know, maybe we're still going to work out to an acceptable end state anyway. It's just going to take a, long, a lot more time and, and, and with more suffering along the way. Sir? Well, I, I respectfully disagree with the, with the latter part. I mean, the first part, I agree with you, do need a good local partner. But remember, it's not just an act of God that delivers a local partner to you. Remember what happened, for example, in the Philippines, 
where when Lansdale showed up there for his second tour in 1950, Mogsai was not president. He'd just been appointed defense minister, and in part he'd been appointed defense minister because of American pressure uh, to appoint him. And then Lansdale cultivated him, worked with him, helped him to become president, and so he, he kind of created the leadership uh, because he knew that this guy was going to be very effective. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to some extent you are at the mercy of the local leaders, and, and part of the problem in Vietnam was that there was never an effective alternative to ZM, and Lansdale was smart enough to perceive it, whereas the Kennedys just kind of closed their eyes and hoped for the best that somebody good, something good would come out of the coup. Um, now today, um, again, I would kind of disagree with your assessment about Syria and Afghanistan. I think actually in Afghanistan, we do have a pretty good leader in Ashraf Ghani, because unlike Hamid Karzai, uh, he's not compromised by the system of corruption. He's not in bed with the warlords to the same extent. Uh, he's actually trying to fight uh, the corruption and, 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 and prosecuting some corrupt officials. You know, he's a pro-Western reformer. I think not, not necessarily the most charismatic guy, but I think pretty well-intentioned. And, uh, you know, he could certainly qualify to teach a class at any American university on, on reform in the third world because he's done that before. He's written those books. Um, so I think he's worth backing. Um, uh, and in the case of Syria, yes, I mean, by and large, not a lot of great alternatives. Uh, you know, Bashar Assad is never going to be America's man in Damascus. I think the, uh, uh, the best bet in Syria is actually, I think, at this point to work with the Kurds, the YPG, uh, who assisted us in defeating Islamic State, and I would say basically help them to carve out about the part of the country they control, which is about 25 percent, as an independent enclave, much as we help the Kurds in Iraq, because I think that they're, at this point, kind of the only acceptable bet in Syria, even though they're not going to take over the whole country, but at least there's going to be like a small chunk of the country that won't be so bad. I, I see a historical pattern that you touched upon quite a lot earlier, but I was thinking about European and American imperialism and T.E. Lawrence. Uh, T.E. Lawrence has a very similar uh, kind of point of view towards uh, governance. He was looking for home rule from the Arabs, and he was completely blindsided by the sites of peace that were And uh, that kind of victory from imperialism. And I, uh, I just wondered what the picture would be like in the Arabian Peninsula now if somehow or other Lawrence had been able to continue with the uniting of the Arab tribes. Well, that's another road not taken, and one that I have not, I have not really thought deeply about. But you're absolutely right. I think there's a lot of similarities between Lawrence and Lansdale, in that they were both very successful at integrating with these local cultures and influencing their leaders, but much less successful at influencing the leaders back home. And ultimately, they felt betrayed and sold out by policymakers in London and in Washington. And in both cases, they ended their their days with this haunting sense of of failure. Um, you know, Lawrence, I would say, was probably more brilliant than Lansdale and also much more fragile uh, mentally. And so he was, you know, as he himself admitted, was, was perched on the precipice of madness many times. Lansdale was kind of a much more genial, laid back, kind of more, uh, you know, less, less extreme character. But they both felt that, 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 that sense of failure at the end of their days. And, and in both cases, you can wonder about how things would have worked out differently if ultimately their advice had been taken. I wonder also where we are headed with a uh, continuing emphasis on a kind of imperial colonial uh, style of independence. Well, I don't think we're quite in the same league as, as the British or French. I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, we're, we're not quite imposing our will in, in the way that they did. Well, if you want to know about the surge, I feel compelled to put on a book, <laughs> book plug for it for a book called The Surge. It would really help if you don't destroy the government beforehand. That had a lot to do with why we had 100,000 plus troops. 
Right, exactly. I mean, that's the, obviously the big difference. That's, 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 that's what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. It also happened basically in Vietnam where we destroyed the government, now with an invasion, but with the coup against CM, which destroyed stability. And so, yeah, I mean, if, if, if there's no longer a functioning state and there's no longer an effective military force, and if you care about the outcome, you basically have to wind up sending a large number of American troops. But that was why Lansdale said, let's not overthrow CM because this is going to happen, and why a lot of people me excluded. I mean, I was in favor of the invasion. A lot of smart people were saying, not a good idea. And in hindsight, I wish they had been listened to, uh, because again, the cost of you know destroying the government are very high, and it's very hard to fill in the vacuum uh, once all authority is gone. Yeah. Uh, as Lansdale is dismissed or marginalized, he's watching what is going on in terms of U.S. politics in talking about the. Wait, who who is doing the propagandizing? Uh, the American government. This is the Pentagon Papers. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, well, he. I mean, he certainly thought that uh, that uh, you know that the official line coming from U.S. Embassy in Saigon, from the Pentagon, from MACV, Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, the Department of Defense. I mean, he thought it was BS. I mean, I, just reading his letters, I can see it there because he was writing in 65, 66, 67, pointing out the incongruity of, you know, the Pentagon claiming these vast body counts. And at the end of the year, the CI estimate would be that there were more Viet Cong insurgents in the South than there had been at the beginning of the year. And so Lansdale immediately perceived, like, these numbers don't add up. This doesn't make any sense. How is this progress? And Gradually, McNamara started seeing the same thing, and that's what led to his, you know, quasi-mental breakdown. Uh, but Lansdale, and this went back to the earlier point about did he join the anti-war movement? He did not, and I mean, he remained up until the summer of 1968 a, a U.S. government official, and so he felt compelled to try to put the best face possible on this. And in, in the process of doing so, I would say he kind of undermined uh, his own credibility and reputation because by this time. Uh, you know, a lot of the correspondents who wrote the, 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 the story of the Vietnam War, people like David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan and Stanley Carnell, they didn't know Lansdale at the height of his effectiveness in the 1950s when he was truly a kingmaker in the Philippines and Vietnam. They really only knew him in the 1960s when he was seen as this increasingly marginalized figure, uh, kind of made fun of by the, the power brokers at the embassy and at MACV because he had so little influence, and then they would listen to Ed Lansdale and they would hear what they thought were these very simple pieties and homilies and, and kind of gung-ho Americanism and we can still win and stuff like that. And so they tended to write him off as being kind of this simplistic ad man slash con man who didn't really understand the larger forces of revolution. I mean, you can read that basically word for word in the work of Frankie Fitzgerald, Halberstam, she and all of the great correspondents on Vietnam. But again, I would cite to you my conversation with Dan Ellsberg, who could not be accused of being some kind of pro-war propagandist, at least not anymore. Uh, and what, what Dan Ellsberg said to me was that Lansdale kind of had this facade in public, this raw, raw, gung-ho, American hasty type of facade, uh, because he thought it was necessary to preserve public support for the war effort. But in private, he was actually a very sophisticated and discerning observer. Uh, who was not at all optimistic in his in his read of the war, and I can I can back that up from having read his personal letters and top secret cables and so forth. He was much gloomier than than the average U.S. policymaker was, but that didn't really come out in public, and so he, you know, he you know trying to be a good soldier, uh, he basically wound up discrediting himself. Sir. Uh, the relationship to Nasser uh, or in India. And in 
that I see among the Bellows brothers at Lindsay, in contrast to say Atchison, is a real switch to a view that's not so different than the Europeans. The, the key criteria is can you find a pro-American guy who will do your bidding? Not can you find someone who actually has legs to mess with them. And I'm wondering how we tease the parts back in the lands of the story. Because what are you really looking for? Because in the Philippines, you found something you, you, in your account had both. He would do his bidding and have to have legs. And in Vietnam, he couldn't find that, or in Cuba, he couldn't find that. I wonder whether you can really often find that, because typically, in that period, when the kingmaker came from outside, it quickly discredited the legitimacy in an era of national anti-colonialism of the person they were making the king. Well, I think you were right about the, the Dulles brothers' mindset, but although Lansdale was certainly protected by the Dulles brothers, I don't think he quite had the same uh, somewhat cynical outlook because he generally wanted to help people in, in the Philippines and Vietnam to find leaders who would be good leaders and who could win popular support, would also be pro-American, but fundamentally uh, be legitimate and, and popular. And I think he did find that uh, with Ramon Magsai Sai because even though Lansdale did help him to win the 1957 election, Magsai Sai was genuinely popular and it was a great tragedy in Philippine history when Mike Sai Sai died in an airplane crash in 1957, I mean, he's still revered as being probably the greatest president in the history of the Philippines. Uh, so he was a, a genuinely, uh, uh, he was a, a leader with legs, as, as you would put it. And Lansdale was trying to give ZM some legs, too. I mean, Lans I mean, ZM did have some legs. He did have some legitimacy, as, an, as I mentioned, as an anti-communist and anti-colonialist. And I think if he had ruled more wisely, he would have gained even more legitimacy. Even, even with all the mistakes that he made at the end of the day, you can see the fact that overthrowing him made the situation worse, not better. And so he was, as Lansdale said, the least bad alternative. I mean, you're right that there's always this tension that anybody we support has to fight charges of being an American puppet. That, and, and, and both Moxai Sai and ZM had to fight those charges. Uh, now, in the case of the Philippines, it was not that effective because Magsai, because the Philippines I was a pretty pro-American country, and so Mog Sai Sai could basically say, yeah, the Americans support me, isn't that great? And that was actually a selling point for him. It wasn't a problem. It was, it was a bigger problem, I would say, in the Philippines and certainly or in, in Vietnam and certainly in other countries, but it wasn't, I wouldn't necessarily say it was debilitating, and, and certainly this notion that ZM, uh, you know, was, was a puppet of the United States was, was disproven by events because we wound up overthrowing him. He actually, and obviously had a very independent mindset, and, you know, if you read the communist historians and, 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 and their obituaries on the ZM regime, I mean, they say that he was a, a pretty wily and formidable adversary. They saw him as a real threat to their rule, more so than the generals uh, who came after him. But, I mean, that's a constant balancing act. I mean, you don't want to be, obviously, have somebody identified as an American puppet. But I wouldn't also say that, that American support is the kiss of death, because I think in most countries around the world, there's a very complicated, ambivalent relationship regarding the United States uh, that we're both loved and, and, and loathed. Uh, we are resented and admired. People don't want to be seen as puppets, but they do want American support. And you see that in places like Iraq, for example. Uh, I mean, we'll see how that works out. I mean, we're, we're trying to support Prime Minister Abadi, and I think he wants that support now uh, to offset uh, the Iranian influence in his country. Certainly, Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan wants American support. Uh, and I don't think it's seen as being a, a, a kiss of death for him. But obviously it has to be managed in, a, in an intelligent and hopefully not overly heavy-handed fashion. And ideally, if you can do it right, you wind up in a situation like Colombia, which has been one of the great counterinsurgency success stories in recent years because of the leadership of President Uribe and then President Santos uh, with Planned Colombia and American advisors supporting them, but uh, without Americans in the lead with the locals in the lead and with, and, you know, with great leadership. And I think that's certainly uh, very necessary uh, to prevail in these kinds of conflicts. Max, do you think we've gone too far in the direction of non-interference in other countries' affairs? I know some people might disagree, but you know, in the 50s, you, you had Edward Lansdale was practically the campaign manager for Ramon, Ramon Mod Society. Fast forward to 2010, where you have an election in Iraq won by Ayatollah, who's a pro-American candidate, and we do nothing 
to help him cement the majority in the Council of Representatives. In fact, we do the opposite. We throw our support behind it, the guy that didn't win the election. What has happened to us? Have <laughs> we become a shadow of our former selves? Or you know, are we wringing our hands over the ethical implications or, or what? I think that's a good question. I think we've become we become very cognizant of the point that was just made and that we're very fearful that if we meddle in other countries' affairs and if candidates are identified as being pro-American and, and, and supported by us, that'll backfire, blow up in our faces. You know, we can't keep a secret in the age of WikiLeaks and all this kind of stuff. But I think we need to rethink that because what we're seeing now is that our enemies are engaging in very effective political warfare, whether it's the Iranians with the Quds Force, the Russians uh, with their little green men. I mean, think about the fact that uh, the most successful Russian attack on, on America in our history was the Russian subversion of the 2016 presidential election, a way for them to exert their power uh, without risking a confrontation with the American military and essentially rendering our entire armed forces utterly superfluous because they figured out how to undermine us on the home front. I mean, these, and of course, now you're seeing the Russians support these populist, anti-American, anti-EU, pro-Russian movements like the Five Star Movement in Italy, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, there are many other examples. They are waging political warfare, just as the Iranians are, by backing their proxies in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, etc. And I, I mean, I agree with the import of your question. I think that we need to engage uh, in, in this kind of political warfare as well. I mean, I think we can feel very high-minded and pure and wash our hands of these sordid political dealings, uh, but we're basically ceding the battleground in doing so uh, to our enemies. Of course, very hard to fight back against some of these, these foes, like the Russians, uh, when the sympathies of the commander-in-chief are very much in doubt. Any other questions? Yep. So, a year or two from now, what do you, what do you think the Korean Peninsula looks like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm hoping... Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping it will not be a smoldering ruin. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I would certainly hope that the Trump administration is not actually planning a, a preventative military strike against North Korea. I think that's. I mean, that's. I mean, I would say that my sense of of what people in South Korea are afraid of. I would say they're afraid. Uh, you know, either a uh, that Trump will sell out South Korea in a deal with North Korea, or b that he will attack North Korea and, and trigger Korean War II, this time with nuclear weapons, I would advise against either option. But I think knowing Trump and how volatile and unpredictable he is, either option is a real possibility. You just don't know what the guy is going to do. Um, and I would, I mean, I think we should basically just stick to the maximum pressure strategy. I think the sanctions are paying off. I think you're seeing uh, Kim Jong-un trying to restart uh, negotiations because he's feeling the pressure. But I don't think he's feeling enough pressure to actually give up his nuclear arsenal. So I think we need to stick with the sanctions for several years, as we did with, in the case of Iran, and see what happens to really turn the screws on uh, North Korea. Uh, and in the meantime, I think avoid precipitating a conflict. The last preventative war we fought did not work out too well. And I would say that in general, we should stick to the tried and true deterrence and containment. Uh, I mean, I don't really understand this panic in Washington about the North Koreans getting an ICBM with a nuclear warhead that can hit Washington. I mean, hello, the Russians have had hundreds and even thousands of those warheads for decades, and we didn't seriously contemplate going to war against the Soviet Union uh, to stop a, a, a first strike uh, because we, we understood that they were rational and they could be deterred. And I don't think there's any reason to doubt that, uh, you know, that North Korea can also be deterred. I mean, in this confrontation, frankly, if there is any uh, irrational madman with nuclear weapons. It's not the guy in Pyongyang. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if you have not um, heard enough of Max, I uh, would like to uh, let you know that there is a, a debate open to the public <coughs> in the psychology building, uh, which is right across from the Wilsey Health Center in room uh, six. And he will be debating our very own John Mueller on uh, the future of U.S. policy in Afghanistan. And that will be held in one hour at 6 o'clock uh, to 7.30. So we can all troop down there after Max signs his books that you're all going to buy, which are available out, out in the hallway. Um, 
very, very wonderful presentation, yeah. very informative. Please uh, join me in thanking you.